So let's go right into the word of the Lord. I'm going to be opening with Proverbs 29 and 18. And Proverbs 29 and 18 reads, When there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Because vision becomes law. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. He, the second passage of scripture I'm going to be reading from the book of Habakkuk, the second chapter, and I'm going to begin reading at the second verse. And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Though it tarry, wait for it, for it will surely come, it will not tarry. And so when, when we talk about the word vision, the first thing I want you to do, especially for the studious sons and daughters in this feed on tonight, that believe in taking notes so that they can go back and study the scriptures and search them to see that everything that is being taught is so uh, uh, according to scripture and in regards to the history that I'm going to give you on tonight. Vision in the Hebrew is Kazon, C-H-A-Z-O-N. And I have to give you history. I want to lay a foundation because this series is going to continue as long as the Lord gives me clarity and understanding and, and gives me deeper depth and insight in regards to where we must go and, and, and the prayer track and the vision track that we must lay for 2024. So vision in the Hebrew is Kazan, C-H-A-Z-O-N. And Kazan in the Hebrew means this, and I'm going to repeat it for you that are taking notes so that you can write it down and you can go back and you can revisit it. So Kazan in the Hebrew means prophecy in its broadest sense. And Kazan means that vision is a mark or a sign of the revelation of God's will that's made manifest through the agent of vision. And, and Kazan directs the course of events and it's intended to work in coordination with the supreme authority of God for everything that will be accomplished in the earth. And so uh, vision, we work in conjunction and in coordination with vision. And so everything that the Holy Spirit, uh, the Lord gave me a prayer some years ago, and is that I, 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 I operate and I come into agreement with, with everything that God has has laid out everything that the Holy Spirit has uh, in store or has in plan for my life, then I work in coordination with the vision of the Lord for my life. So let me repeat that. The vision, the word, uh, uh, um, the Hebrew word for vision is kazon, C-H-A-Z-O-N, which is prophecy, and you got to get this, because vision is very prophetic. When we say vision, then we think of a, a dream or something that the Lord shows us on our bed or, or daydreaming. No, no, no. See, a dream is nothing but an involuntary mental experience during sleep. But a vision is intentional conscious goals that we work towards and actively pursue in our waking life. While we are awake, dreams are while you are asleep. A vision is while you are awake. And so visions are very prophetic. And so it is a prophecy, get this, in its broadest sense and is a mark or a sign. A vision is a mark or a sign 
of the revelation of God's will made manifest through the agent of vision, which directs the course of events. You're going to get it in a moment. Which directs the course of events and vision is intended to work in coordination with us and the supreme authority of God for everything that will be accomplished in the earth. Because see, what you have to understand is there's a major conflict that's going on in the earth. There is a major battle that happens between the world of light and the world of darkness. And this major angelic conflict in the heavenlies is, is, is designed and is determined by the devil himself to oppose uh, the, and, and to blind the men and women and the sons and daughters of God to oppose the revealed will and purpose of God from getting through by the power of vision and revelation. If he can keep you blinded, if he can keep you in the dark in regards to God's vision, which is the revelation of God, what God discloses to man, what man could not find out for himself. And so the major conflict in the heavenlies, come on, it's not to keep you broke because if you really get a vision about your money and about your finances, trust me that the wealth will be manifested in your life. It's, it's, it's not your money, it's your vision. It's your vision. And the major angelic conflict in the heavenlies is to oppose the revealed will of God, the revealed purpose of God from getting to you through the power of vision and revelation. And why is this? Because, see, when you have vision, then you have the power and you have the ability to self-manifest. What did I just say? When you have vision, you have the power and the ability to self-manifest. Death and life is in the power of your tongue. You shall have whatsoever you say. You have the power and the ability to self-manifest. You leave from being a pauper and a slave and a beggar. The elementary, beggarly elements that so many lay at the feet of Jesus and beg for every day is manifested in life through vision. And so we don't lack money. We don't lack a, a, a sight. We lack vision. Vision is what you, uh, sight is what you see with your eyes open. Vision is what you see with your eyes closed. Vision is what you see beyond your physical sight. And so why does the enemy want to keep you blinded? Because when you have vision, you have the power and the ability to self-manifest. And it's one thing that you need to understand tonight, and I'm going to make abundantly clear. We all have the responsibility to self-manifest. And understanding the principle of self-manifestation is God's divine strategy for your life. We were designed to co-labor with God. And in co-laboring with him through the vision and the revelation of God, then we call those things that be not as though they already were. So we bring things from the invisible into the visible by the power of vision. And see, what you have to understand is life is a journey for all of us. Life is a journey. And, and as you know, every journey has a destination. Now, I'm not talking about destination, heaven or hell. That's your final destination. Your destination in life. There is a destiny. I told you God is responsible for your purpose. You are responsible for your potential. You have a destination in life that's going to that that that's going to either be in coordination with your final destination or it's not going to be. You must have a vision for your life, where you will end up in life and what you will accomplish 
in life, personally, professionally, spiritually. Because everybody ends up somewhere in life. Everybody. And the thing about it, a few people end up somewhere on purpose. And those are the ones with vision. Well, some look at those and they figure, oh, God has smiled on them. And God, you know, they were born with a silver spoon in their mouth. Or their economic status or their financial status was a whole lot better than mine. And that's why they ended up in life. No, sweetheart. Because a lot of people that have manifested, self-manifested in life by the power of revelation and vision came from some low places. But they believed in the vision of God for their life. See, vision is key for your life. Vision is not optional. Where there is no vision, people perish. The people of God are perishing, not because you don't love God, not because you don't give your tithe and offering, not because you don't worship and you don't praise. You have no vision. That is your responsibility. That's your responsibility to search out the vision so that you can self-manifest by the divine strategy of God. We were designed to co-labor with God. And, 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 and here's the perjury against mystery. Here is the perjury against divine revelation and vision. When we don't self-manifest, when we don't manifest the divine purpose and vision of God for our life, when we don't seek it out, when we participate more in somebody else's life and vision, more than we do our own, then we're telling God that ours is not worth it. And then when we don't manifest, then what we're carrying, listen to me clearly, when you fail to self-manifest like the servant that was given the talent, he was given a vision and he refused to self manifest. He refused to seek out how to multiply and manifest the gift, the vision, the talent that he had been given. And when we don't self-manifest, then what we're carrying, the world and God will ignore. You think because you cry, you think because you, you live a miscellaneous life, you have no vision, oh, we're going deep, you have no purpose, you get up every day without an itinerary, you get up every day without a schedule, you get up every day and you just live life miscellaneously, then you tell God that his vision for your life, that the manna from heaven give us this day our daily bread, my daily vision, my daily schedule, my daily itinerary. When I live life visionless, I qualify for God to ignore me. I qualify for the world to ignore me. Why? Because I am miscarrying the vision and the purpose of God. And this is why apostolic and prophetic voices and authority are so critically necessary in this hour. Because apostolic voices remove excuses. Apostolic voices gut you out and cause you to discover the potential power that has not been tapped into your life yet because you're lazy, uh-huh, because you want it to be handed to you on a silver platter, uh-huh, because you don't want to tap into what it is that God has told you to search out. Search it like a man searching for a lost treasure. Search it out like a man searching for hidden diamonds. Search it out. You know, the saddest thing is that, uh, let me talk to a few of you. You know, the saddest thing is that most people live in the earth 
I never manifest themselves. They give birth to babies. They give birth to their sons and daughters. But they never give birth to themselves. They never self-manifest. They never come to the fullest potential of purpose and power that God has called them to. Do you know why? Because they have no personal vision. If you are living without vision, you are living a perjurous life. You commit perjury. What is perjury in the court system? Uh, to willfully be a lying testimony of something, of evidence that you have not seen or that you have not heard. So if I am the testimony of Jesus Christ in the earth, every day that I live visionless, every day that I live purposeless, then I commit perjury against the testimony of Jesus Christ in my life. And most people never manifest themselves. They die and they are buried. And the only way someone knows that they've been here, the only way that someone knows that they ever existed is by their tombstone. You have no right to live visionless. It is a breach of a spiritual principle. When Jesus went to hell, he led captivity captive and he gave gifts unto men, grace gifts, gifts for and by to manifest the vision of God in your life. How dare you live in the earth all of your life in perjury against the testimony of Jesus Christ? Huh? And if you broke, you're glory-less. You can't testify to anybody. You live in contradiction. And you live in conflict. This is what it means to commit perjury. You live in conflict. And you live in contradiction of the divine purpose of God within you. Please don't say you carry the seed of God. Please don't say that you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And there is nothing in the womb of your spirit. John the Baptist had a womb encounter before he ever came out. Martha, Elizabeth walked in the room where Mary was pregnant with Jesus and he leaped as confirmation what was in him, what was in the womb of Mary. Jesus was there. How do you have Jesus and you are visionless? How do you have Jesus? And you live by no daily purpose. How do you have Jesus? How? You are the perfect candidate for being cast into outer darkness. Because you become a backslider in heart. And all of the backsliders in heart will be cast into outer darkness. You become a backslide. How dare you trample into 2024 expecting God to manifest anything for you and nothing has been manifested in you. You become a backslider in heart who will always, and then you become evil, uh-huh, uh-huh. Beware, lest there enter into any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. You become a backslider in heart, and, and you are the ones who always judge God. You are the backsliders who always judge God by what he didn't do in your life because you lack vision. Because you lack purpose. Because you wouldn't get up out of the bed. Because you would lay on your face and seek the Lord in regards to what it is. And so I understand why you broke down. I understand why you're depressed. I understand why you suffer from anxiety attacks. Because lack of vision will break you down. You're perishing. Whatever you are be, uh, created to become, you're not waiting on God to do it. You possess it now. 
You were created with it in you. Your future is not ahead of you. It's trapped inside of you. You're not waiting for God to reveal your future. The greatest depression in the world. How many witnesses do I have in this feed? The greatest depression in the world. Comes from trapped vision. Trapped purpose and the danger is if it's if purpose and vision stays trapped too long it turns into perversion and so a lot of people that transgress the righteousness of God is because they have had trapped vision in them for so long. That's just like a mother carrying a stillborn child and it is never removed from her womb. It will poison her own system, her whole system and ultimately kill her too. Why? Because what's in you have died. You would not feed it. No, you want God to do it. You want to come to church and you want somebody to lay hands on you and jumpstart your vision. Baby, can't nobody do that but God. Huh? The word of God and your leader. We, we're here to feed the vision, but only God can give the seed of vision. Only God can give the seed of vision. Lack of vision will break you down. Lack of vision will send you into depression. Yes, it will. Lack of vision will, will, will cause you to be promiscuous. Lack of vision will cause you to be more active than everybody else's life other than your own. Lack of vision will cause you to go crazy. And you'll keep defaulting back to what was because you have no present vision. What's happening? You're deteriorating in the spirit. Your future is deteriorating. Your purpose is deteriorating because where there's no vision, people perish. Whatever you were created to become, you, you have it now. You don't lack it. You have it now. It's trapped in you. Have you ever got serious enough to shut down everybody and do an internal search of your internal society. Call on the mentors and the voices that God have assigned to you and tell them it is time to find my vision. I have got to tap into purpose. I refuse to live another year vision less, purpose less. Waltzing through church and religious routines without vision. See, it is required. I want you to write this in your notes. Write this in your notes. It is required of me. It is required of my spirit. To walk abroad, to walk outside of me like the spies of Israel that spied out the land. It is required of every man and woman that their spirit within should walk abroad and discover what is beyond him or her. I told you anything in a comfort zone is going to die. If you're afraid to move beyond the boundaries of your limitations, if you're afraid to move beyond the box that you have trapped God and your vision and your purpose in, you're going to die there. You got to move beyond yourself. You got to go beyond yourself because if your spirit, listen to me clearly, if your spirit never rises above the limits of your present life and money, and move beyond the boundaries of what you are now, what you see now, you'll be bound to poverty and lack and depression for the rest of your life. Command your spirit. 
when you go to sleep tonight. And that is what happens during consecration. Your spirit has the propensity when it is free to ascend before God while you are asleep. And it ascends before God, before the throne of God for your answer, for your vision, for your reality and your purpose. And it descends back into your spirit and you wake up with the answer and you wake up with the revelation and you wake up with the vision. Yes, you do. If you never allow your spirit and how do I allow my spirit? Come on, you got to come into that transition zone. How do I allow my spirit? Oh, 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 oh my God. How do I allow my spirit to transcend the bounds of the earth and tap into the supernatural vision of God that men and women are locked out of? The volume is too high. They can't even calibrate to that ascension because it's progressive. You got to start in the presence of God in prayer and consecration. And if you don't have a prayer life, stop lying and saying that I want to know what God's purpose is for my life. When he wakes you up at two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock, five, six o'clock, and you are too slothful to heed to the voice of the Lord, how are you going to carry out his vision? And you won't respond to his voice. How you are going to do it. The ascension is progressive. I go from glory to glory. From faith to faith. Beyond one limitation to the next. Beyond the boundaries of my own limitations to the next. And I rise beyond poverty and lack and everything that the devil tells me that I can't get back. But see, we're so used to complaining. Write in your notes, Proverbs 18 and 20. Would somebody put that in the feed? And I want you to read that in your own time. We are so bound by our own limitation. You know why you're bound? You know why vision won't break through? Because your mouth has stopped it. Death by tongue. Limited by tongue. Bound by tongue tongue hung by the tongue if you've been complaining you're dying according to proverbs 18 and 20 you don't want vision you want death because that's all you speak well i'm not speaking death israel died because of murmuring and complaining in the wilderness thank you apostle push me if you've been complaining you're dying and you don't even know, you don't know where that fascination comes from when you feed off of your own emotions. Every time you complain, it makes death feel better, not you. You think as you feeling better, baby, death is capitalizing on you. And so then we need to know, Prophetess April, what is the first key to achieving my vision and, 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 and self-manifesting? The first key to achieving your vision, I want somebody to put it in his feet and for you that are taking notes and whatever we don't finish tonight, I promise you we're coming back next week stronger. The first key to achieving your vision is self-discipline. Proverbs 29 and 18, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. How does that be part of the scripture coincide with where there's no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Where there is no vision, people perish. Paul states, I want you to put in the feed Ephesians 1, 17 and 18. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints is. The eyes of our understanding being enlightened. The eyes of my understanding must be enlightened to receive 
vision. And the first key to achieving vision is self-discipline. And see, many of you will never get there because you say, I want to be better. You say, I want to go higher. You say, God, I want greater. But every time somebody challenges you and, and attempts to discipline you in certain areas of your life, every time that iron comes alongside you to sharpen you, we only seem to follow so far. Yeah, we call those types of people mean and hard and they have no compassion because they want to see you live beyond where you are. Where there's no vision, the people perish. Listen, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, where there is no divine revelation. Divine revelation is what comes to supplement our knowledge and correct the ignorance of our unenlightened eye. Divine revelation is what comes through the power a prayer and consecration through the discipline of prayer and con uh, and consecration. And listen, if we never get divine revelation, then you are operating out of your ignorance. I don't care how sharp it seems. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Where there is no divine revelation, then there is no supplementation of our knowledge to correct the ignorance of the unenlightened eye. And if there is no correcting of my ignorance, that's vision, that's revelation. If there is no correcting of my darkness, my ignorance, then I am perishing. There is a perishing. Then there is a stripping. Then there is a nakedness. Then there is a darkness in my land. And then what happens? Invisible barriers and, and the forces of darkness that you better hear me tonight. The invisible barriers and the forces of darkness that are always at work to determine your destiny when. But there comes a time in your life. Are you hearing me, Francis? Are you hearing me, Donna Owens? Blessings to you, Casey Lewis. So good to see you, sweetheart. There comes a time when you must release yourself from every evil inheritance in order to enjoy the blessings of your personal vision. See, a lot of sons and daughters, a lot of men and women cannot enjoy the blessings of the revelation of God for their personal vision because they're still bound by evil inheritance. Uh huh. Evil customs, evil hereditary, you know, traits and transgenerational patterns and generational cultures that they're not willing to let go of. But what you have to understand. Thank you, intercessors. Somebody's praying for me in this feed tonight. What you have to understand. Blessings to you, Prophetess Amber. Thank you, sweetheart. Where vision is not continuous, where vision is not uninterrupted in your life, where vision comes in flashes, where visions are sporadic and fluctuating, who am I talking to? You will always experience intervals of distressing darkness yeah. and you wonder what's wrong with you. Oh my God. You, you, you won't keep the straight and narrow. You won't, you won't keep your eye on the prize. You keep turning to the left or to the right. And every time you get your focus, every time you get set on the straight and narrow, don't the devil always send something or somebody Come on here. to rob you of your vision again. Absolutely. Every time your vision is not continuous, vision has to be consistent. You, you got to set your eye on the prize. 
It's got to be continuous. It's got to be uninterrupted in your life. It, 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 it can't come in flashes. It, it can't be sporadic and, and fluctuating. And when you go through a storm and when you go through a trial, when your marriage is in trouble, when your money is short, whatever is going on. The one that told you they loved you, you find out they really didn't. Was was your vision connected to that? Uh -huh. Is that how weak the vision of God is? No, but the enemy will use those types. Let me talk to you. The enemy will use those types of tests and strategies and deceit to rob you. Of your focus. If he gets your focus, he's got your vision. And see, he knows that when your vision is not consistent, mm -hmm. when your vision is interrupted, yeah. when your vision comes in flashes, you understand what I'm saying, yeah. Apostle? Yeah. When your visions are sporadic and fluctuating, you are who is experiencing, I mean, intervals of distressing darkness. Intervals of distressing darkness. Who am I talking to? Sometimes these intervals are short and sometimes they're long. But these intervals are designed by the devil for you to realign yourself with your former. Instead of realigning yourself with your vision and listen to the silent voices of nothingness within. And so many fall prey to this and it happens because your ear has not been obedient to the Lord long enough for the vision of God to be consistent and the solid vision of the last days I'll pour my spirit on all flesh sons and daughters shall prophesy young men and old men see dreams and visions but it only falls on obedient ears Many of you, you don't want a vision, you want a dream. You, you don't want a vision. And what you have to understand, the vision of God is withdrawn when the eyes of men are blinded by sin and worldliness. Oh God. When your eyes have been blinded with worry and doubt and concerns. And this is what the word of the Lord means. Where there's no vision, people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. When you keep the law, happy are ye. But see, this is what happens. The vision is withdrawn when the eyes of men are, 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 are blinded by sin and worldliness. And what happens? And the people cast off restraint. And the people become ungovernable, where they cannot be controlled. Any means of curbing appetites, any means of restraining passions, any means of directing our step is hopeless. And you didn't know that all that was connected to your vision, did you? Woe to the people who are visionless. See, the fatal effect, I want you to write this in your notes, the fatal effect of the absence of such revelation, the fatal effect of the absence of vision is stated in scripture to be confusion, disorder, and rebellion. And you wonder why folk are acting the way that they are in the house of God. You wonder why they come and they have nothing. Sweetheart, it doesn't have anything to do with worship. It had anything to do with the lack of praise. It has everything to do with lack of vision. People are uncontrolled. And people who are uncontrolled, people who have no vision, people who are unrestrained, people who, who cannot be controlled in their passions, people who, who have no means of, of curbing their appetite, people who will not hear the voice of the Lord through the voice of his apostle and his prophet, woe to the people. You can't do anything with those people. They lack vision. And the principal command of God is if you lack vision, 
you're going to be destroyed. Not by God, not by anyone on the outside. Your undisciplined ways, your undisciplined measures are going to cause you to be destroyed. That, that's the fatal effect of, of the absence of vision, the absence of revelation. That's why the enemy fights you for your focus. This is why he fights you for your vision. And the scripture clearly states, without vision, you're going to be confused. There's going to be disorder and there's going to be rebellion. People uncontrolled fall into grievous excess. Watch this, which nothing but high principle God vision can curb, can restrain. Are you hearing me? What time do I have? Are you hearing me? If you look at the word of God, if you look at the scripture, and I want you to write these scriptures down. If you look at the word of God, and if you look at the scriptures, I have them here. And I'm not going to read them tonight, but I want you to. Blessing son, Apostle Kirby. If you look at the scripture and take note of Eli's time, when there was no open vision, every man did what was right in his own eyes. First Samuel third chapter. In Asa's days, when Israel had been without a teaching priest, because they would not abide by the vision of the Lord, so he hid their teachers from them. For a long period of time. Second Chronicles 15 and 3. Or when Ahaz. Made Judah naked. For lack of vision. For lack of revelation. Or when the people were destroyed in Hosea. For lack of vision. Or lack of knowledge. Therefore according to the scripture. The importance of vision is primary. When it comes to regulating your life and maintaining your relationship with God. Not just not your tithing offering, not your worship. Blessed is the man who keeps the law. That's the second clause of that verse. In other words, where there's no vision, Pastor Tiffany, people throw off restraint. No, it's not because they're going through a storm. Because he is able to secure those that walketh uprightly before him, no matter what storm you go through. That's not it. Your vision is what keeps you in your storm. Your vision is what keeps you in your rain. Your vision is what keeps your feet from sliding. Blessed is the man that keeps the law. Where there is no vision, people throw off restraint. That's what it means by people perish. That's what the word perish means. It means people who have no vision. Why? Because they have nothing to aim at. Why? Because they have nothing set before them. They have no prize set before them. And when that's why it's not good to give people things and give people handouts that they have not worked for. Because if it did not cost them anything, it's going to be worth little value to them moving forward. And they cast off all restraint. They cast off self-control. In other words, where there is no vision, hear me tonight. Where there is no revelation of the future, people throw off self-discipline. People live any kind of way. When they have no vision, they have no aim, they have no direction, they have no focus, they have nothing set before him. Even Jesus, who for the, 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 the cross that was set before him, him, him for the, 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 joy. the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. Who for the joy. Your vision ought to bring you joy in the midst of your furnace, in the midst of your storm. And the only way it won't, the only way you're going to go out and act silly and act crooked is because you have no vision from the beginning. Huh? Your whole foundation is nothing but hype and emotionalism and, and, and you know, uh, penance and, and traditions and, and rituals and customs. And, and when all of that dies down, you have nothing. Where there is no vision, you throw off restraint. Church is not your vision. Wow. Worship is not your vision. Wow. 
Your vision is the key to your life. Yes. Why is vision the key to my life? Because it's vision that imposes the weight of discipline and boundaries and law upon me. It's my vision that causes me to walk circumspect. It is the vision. It is the portrait of what God has shown me. That keeps me focused. Discipline is so powerful. You have a lot of people, they will never enter into legitimate realms of authority. I don't care how gifted they are. I don't care how long they've been in the church. I don't care how talented they are. They will never enter into legitimate realms of authority because there are higher levels of discipline that qualify you for legitimate realms of authority. There are higher levels of discipline that qualify you to move past second heaven interference. Yes, there is. Discipline is powerful. And according to the scriptures, discipline comes from vision. Vision don't come from discipline. You don't discipline yourself to get a vision. You are disciplined because you got one. Uh-huh. Come on. Teach, honey. Ooh. A man or a woman, a son or a daughter, without a clear vision for their life, lives a very loose, miscellaneous kind of life. Lives a trap life. But a man with a vision lives a very narrow life. Broad and wide is the gate that leadeth to destruction. Straight and narrow is the way that leads to life everlasting. A man with a vision lives a very narrow life. When a man or woman has a vision, their life becomes very less complicated. Your life is so complicated because you don't have a vision. You're trying to walk out everybody else's. You're trying to live by everybody else's philosophy concerning your life. You're participating in everybody else's life more than you are in your own. Vision simplifies life. Vision controls all of your choices. Oh no, you, you don't have a problem making a choice. Vision does it. Once you get a vision, once you know where you're going, you automatically know what roads won't take you there. Automatically. Once you know what to do, you automatically know what you shouldn't do. Nobody has to teach you that. And we thought about, well, I did it because of this. Well, I did it because I was hurt. Well, I did it because they betrayed me. Well, I did it because they walked out on me. Honey, if that's not the vision that's in your womb, you ain't walking out no seed. Not one seed that has not been deposited in your womb for your future. Vision even defines your activities in life. Vision gives you a permanent destiny address. Yes, it will. And that's the focus and that's the goal that you have. And you don't veer. You don't let. See the thing about it. Anybody that comes in your life. That causes you to veer off the path of vision. You put them out of your life. Uh, if, you're, if your right eye offend thee. Pluck it out. Uh, if, if, if your right hand offend thee. Cut it off. Who have you cut off? What have you cut off? Oh we're, we're quick to cut off purpose for people. But how many people have you cut off for purpose? Vision defines your activities in life. Yes, it will. Don't tell me you have a vision and you're undisciplined. Vision gives you your permanent destiny address and your destiny will dictate your decisions. Yes, it will. Everything that God has given you a portrait of in your womb must work in conjunction with your destination. See why a lot of people are not getting to their destination because they have a whole lot of isms and schisms and possibilities and and ifs and ain'ts and them and they. They have a whole lot of passions and they have a whole lot of stuff that they haven't dropped off that does not work in conjunction with their destination. And so what what happens, you become a walking contradiction your whole life in church, your whole life journeying with God. And you can't blame it on nobody else because you never circumcised yourself 
to adapt to and accommodate the vision of God within you. I'm talking about for your life. I ain't talking about church and preaching and teaching. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about your life. I'm talking about your dreams and your future. Everything must support your vision. And if it doesn't, you're walking contradiction. All your life, why couldn't you make it? Why couldn't you do it? You sabotaged yourself. Uh, you were in contradiction to yourself. You said you wanted to go there, but you never, you, you never fine-tuned your way. You, you never allowed God to circumcise you and bring you into circumspection for the direction that you were going in. <laughs> Everything, every book, every body, every place, Everything must work in conjunction with your destination. Every moment must support it and not contradict it. Are you getting this tonight? If someone offers you something and it doesn't collaborate with your vision, it's easy to say no when you got a vision. But when you don't have a vision, it's tough to refuse things. It's tough to not yield to temptation. Oh, but when you got a portrait of what you about to lose and how hard you've worked for it and how much hell you've been through, when you get a portrait of the future destiny that you're about to lose, if you yield to this moment of pleasure, you tell the devil no. And you'll have a problem doing it. Oh, when you got vision, because my vision looks a whole lot better than what you're offering me right now. Without a vision, it's tough to refuse things. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Life becomes complicated when there's no vision. This is why your life is complicated. You have no vision. Your vision is your driving force. Are you hearing me? Your vision is your driving force that, that provides you with the purpose and direction in your actions and your decisions. Let me say that again. Your vision is your driving force that provides you with the purpose and directions in your actions and your decisions. It helps you to stay motivated and focused. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Greater is he that is within me than he that is in the world. See, your vision is your mental picture of what you want your life to look like. Not in church. Not, 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 let's, let's cut that out. Let's, let's cut that out. Not in church. Uh -uh. If, if you were to describe, let me speak to some of you tonight. And, and after you get off this feed tonight, I want you to go and write it down. If you were to describe how... How you picture your life 10 years from now. Chances are most of you could paint a very clear picture. An outline of how you want your financial profile to be. What you desire to achieve relationally, economically, educationally. Or, or, or where you want to be professionally. In, in other words, listen. You, you would be able to look beyond what is now. Where you are now. And envision what could be, and in most cases, what should be in your lives. That's vision. And without a clear vision, chances are, many of you have started over and over and over again. You're 20, 30, 40 years old, and you've been around this same mulberry bush all your life. Prayer is not going to fix it. Your shouting and worship is not going to fix it. Your fasting and spitting is not going oh to God, fix it. You getting a vision for time. your life is what's going to fix it. And without a clear vision, chances are that you'll come to the end of your life. Jesus. And wonder what I could have done differently. What should I have done differently? And for many of you, the question you're going to have is, did my life really matter? What did I accomplish? What did I do? 
Come on, somebody. That's the question. That's the big question. That's the big regret. And so you may ask the question, what is vision and where does it come from? I want many of you to go back and listen to this feed on tonight. I know you probably can't take notes fast enough on tonight, but I want you to go back and listen. See, vision is what's born in the soul of the man. It is the seed of God. It's the conversation that God had with you before you were ever released out of eternity to be planted in your mother's womb. Born out of the soul of a man or woman who, see, a man or woman with vision is consumed with tension. Write that in your notes. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give, I'm going to give you, this revelation is going to shake you. A man or woman that has vision, or, or shall I say, who is a, an awesome candidate for vision, is consumed with tension. Who am I talking to? You live it every day, and you think it's the devil, and you think it's anxiety. No, it's not. A man or woman who is carrying vision is consumed with tension between what is and what should be. What is and what could be. What's not and what should be. Anyone who is emotionally involved Anybody in this feed who is frustrated, brokenhearted, maybe even angry tonight about the way things are in, in, in light of the way that things could be impossible and, and the way that you believe things should be, you carry a vision. Oh, man soda bayana man see. Vision disturbs you. People think, oh, when you get a vision, you're just happy. Go like, oh, no, oh, no, no. Ask Ezra, ask Nehemiah. Vision disturbs you. Vision takes your sleep away. Because you see what should be, but it's not. You see how it could be, but it's not. It consumes you with tension. It will consume you with anxiety. And it's not to be prayed away. Uh-uh. You can't fast it away. Uh-uh. The, 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 the strategy and the solution for it is birth do it. No. the vision. You're consumed with tension. And maybe even angry. Who am I talking to? Everybody. The way things are in light of the way they believe things could be carries a vision. You carry a vision. See, visions form in the hearts of those who are dissatisfied with the status quo. Those who are not willing to just go along with come see, come saw. The, the same penis, the same routine, the same ritual. Vision is formed in the heart of those who are dissatisfied with the status quo. And it often begins with the inability to accept things the way they are. And you'll have people around you wonder, why are you so sad? Why are you feeling like this? Well, what's wrong? Honey, things are great. Look at how you're living. But you see a bigger picture. Of how it should be. And where God told you. You should have been 10 years ago. 5 years ago. 15 years ago. Oh yeah it will bring a divine dissatisfaction. See divine dissatisfaction. Will move you. The way that joy can't. And over time. This, this, this is how vision is born. Over time. This dissatisfaction. Matures. And is birthed into a clear picture of what could be, how God wants it to be. And I'm not talking about in church. I'm talking about in systems and, 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 and I'm talking about in, in realms of, of the world and in the marketplace where God has assigned you to outside of the four walls of the church. Yes, yes, yes. But see, a vision is even more than that. Because, I mean, what could be could also be just an idea. It could be just a dream. How do I know the difference between an idea and a dream and a vision? Because an idea or dream does not necessarily have to be a vision and is not necessarily, excuse me, a vision from the Lord. 
I want you to write this in your notes so that you understand that a vision, there is always a moral element to a vision. Meaning, visions carry with it a sense of conviction that you can't shake, that you can't get away from. Anyone with a vision will tell you this is not merely something that can just be done, that can just be picked up, that can just be put down whenever I want. This is something that has got to be done. And if I don't do it, I'm going to suffer the consequences. This is something that must happen. And it's this element of conviction of vision that catapults men and women out of the realm of just a passive concern, just a miscellaneous, you know, uh, just, you know, concern and, and catapults them into action. It is the moral element that gives that vision a sense of urgency and you feel it in this feed and you know you feel it and you've been wondering what it is that you're wrestling with. I want you to write this down. Three things that I'm going to move. I'm not going to try to give it all to you tonight. Three things that vision does. Number one, I want somebody to put this in the feed. Three things that vision does. Number one, vision brings your world into focus. My God, my God. Number two, vision brings order out of your chaos. This is how you know when you've stepped into vision. Number three, vision enables you to see everything differently. Everything. Did you get that? I want to see it. There it is in the feed. Vision brings your world into focus. Vision brings uh, 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 order out of your chaos. And number three, vision enables you to see everything differently. You will not see the same way. You will not see men as trees. You will not see your husband. You will not see your wife. Come on, you will not see your children. You will not see the situation or the circumstance the same way. Not want vision is birthed in your spirit. Four things vision gives in our daily experience. Thank you, son. Thank you for those that are posting this in the feed. Four things that vision gives. In our daily experience. Number one, vision gives passion. Vision evokes emotion. There is no such thing as an emotionless vision. Jesus. No such thing. Wow. Every vision, as I said, from Ezra to Nehemiah, every vision, every burden that they took on for the vision of God, it brought with it great emotion. And when I say emotion, I mean the passion to see the work or the vision accomplished. See, this is the thing, what you have to understand, this is the thing, this is why a lot of people rather daydream than, than get before the Lord and seek him for a vision. Because the, the thing that makes daydreams so enjoyable are the emotions that accompany the daydreams on the images of the mind's eye. And they feed from those emotions. Yeah, 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 y'all know what I'm talking about. This is why we must guard our heart with all diligence because whenever we allow our thoughts to wander outside the boundaries of reality, our emotions are quick to follow. Both negative and positive. And so this is why we have to guard our heart with all diligence. And not allow every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust outside of the boundaries of reality. Outside of the boundaries of, of righteousness. Vision gives you joy in advance. Four things that vision bring. Number one is passion. Vision gives you joy in advance. 
And what vision does, it allows us to experience the joys and the emotions associated with our anticipated future ahead of time. That's the joy of vision. Mm. That's why when something is presented to you that is not of God, you can quickly reject it because the joys anticipated in the vision ahead of time keeps you focused on what God promised you. That's the thing about vision. When you have vision, the joys of the vision are birthed in advance. And you feel the joys and you can experience the joys. And every time you think about it, it causes you to be happy and be joyous and want to rejoice and want to shout. Because vision gives joy in advance. And this is a reason why God releases them ahead of time. Because they serve to reinforce our commitment to the vision. Every time we feel the joy, they serve to reinforce our commitment to the vision. Every time the enemy tries to tempt you, know the joy serves as a reinforcement to that vision. As a reinforcement to that commitment. Because it provides like a sneak preview. Of what is to come. Even the most lifeless. Meaningless task. Begins to feel good when it's attached to a vision. Oh it could have had no life in it. But when it's attached to your vision. The joy that comes and that's connected to a vision. In advance is always channeled back into present reality. Did you get that? It's through the realm of vision. The feelings, the joys reserved for tomorrow are channeled back into present reality. You can't lose heart. You can't lose hope. Not when you really got vision. Is where there's no vision, people perish. Number two is motivation. Number one was passion. Number two is motivation. Vision provides motivation. Vision provides such motivation, Prophetess April, Prophetess Amber, where the meaningless things begin to matter. Yes, they do. What you thought was insignificant, get a vision. Everything begins to matter. You see the heartbeat in everything that's happening and that's going on around you. You begin to prophesy to your environment. Vision driven, because vision driven people are motivated people. Yes, they are. You, you, you get up early. You rise up before the breaking of day. Show me a man or woman who lacks motivation and I'll show you someone with little or no vision. Ideas, yes. Dreams, maybe. Vision, not a chance. Vision is going to cause you to jump up out of that bed. I don't care what has gone wrong in your life. Vision is the reason you get up. Vision is the reason you began. But a lack of vision will be the reason you never finish. Number three, let's get through these, is direction. The most practical blessings to you, Prophetess Delane Smith. Direction, the most practical advantage of vision is it sets direction for our lives. Oh, vision serves as your roadmap. Vision simplifies decision making. You, 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 you don't have to be tossed to and fro. You don't have to fluctuate back and forth. You don't even have to choose. Vision will choose for you. Anything that moves us towards the realization of our vision drives us and everything else must, it, it's got to be approached with caution. Everybody else must be approached with caution. See, people without a vision are clearly distracted. People without a vision live very loose lives. They have nothing to lose. Have you ever heard that? I ain't got nothing to lose. They'll cause you to lose everything. If they can cause you to step outside of the realm and the boundary of your vision. They're easily distracted. 
And they have the tendency to drift from one activity to the next without thinking, without remorse. They have the tendency to drift from one pleasure to the next, one relationship to another, because they have no vision. All life is about is pleasure. All life is about is fulfilling their, their, you know, that Adamic nature. All life is about is fulfilling. Vision becomes your relationship. Vision becomes your financial, your relational, your financial, and your moral compass. You better hear what I'm saying. It gives you direction. Number four, vision gives purpose. Vision translates into purpose. A vision gives you a reason to get up in the morning. Vision tells you if you don't show up, something important will not be accomplished. Pastor Tiffany shared something a few weeks ago and it was so powerful. The anointing of showing up. Is that what it was, Pastor Tiffany? The anointing of the first things or something like that. If you don't, see vision will tell you to get up. If you don't show up, something important will not be accomplished. If you don't show up, apostle says opportunities are not lost. They're just given to the man that showed up. They're given to the woman that showed up. Your vision makes you an important link between current reality and the future. The anointing of first responders, that's it. Vision will tell you to respond first. Get up. That dynamic gives you purpose. And purpose carries with it the momentum to move you through the barriers that would otherwise slow you down and trip you up. Uh huh. The only people that get slowed down and tripped up and give up uh, are the ones you didn't have a vision from the beginning. No, you. I'm gonna try this, and if it don't work, I ain't trying nothing else. Okay, I'm going. I'm gonna try this, and if it don't happen, then I know it wasn't God. I, I'm not going again. You can forget it. See, there's a divine element to vision, also. What time do we have? We're good. There's a divine element to vision, also, and I want you to get this. We, because we've all heard the hype, if you believe you can achieve. And this is true to a certain extent. But, but here's where we have to part ways with the secular, and this cultural belief. See, the average person has the right to dream his own dreams. Hear what I'm saying. And develop how the picture of what his or her future could and should hold. But the only conjunction there is the cross at the cross. Mm. <laughs> Those of us who have sworn allegiance to God lost that right. A man can plan his own ways. A man ways, he can plan his own ways all he wants. But if they're not in conjunction with God's vision... Uh, God will interrupt it because we're not our own. We've been bought with the price according to 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. We are the called according to his purpose, Romans 8 and 8. So honoring God involves discovering his vision of what our lives should be and should look like. Stop, stop playing bumper cars with your life. Just testing stuff, just trying stuff, bouncing off this and bouncing off that. Oh, and that's how I knew it wasn't the will of God because it didn't work. No, you should have had a vision that gave you direction before you even wasted virtue in that relationship, in that area. See, glorifying God involves discovering what he wills that we should accomplish. Because we were created in his image with his purpose in mind. Are you all getting this? And until we discover his purpose and his vision for our life and follow through with what he has designed, there will always be a hole in your soul. 
according to Ephesians 2 and 20. The word of the Lord says that we are his workmanship. That means we are the product of God's vision. God has decided that I should be here. God has decided what I should be and what I could be. I am the outcome of something that God envisioned. And it's through Christ that he has brought and continues to bring about changes in our lives according to his will and according to his good pleasure and according to his vision. We have no right to live visionless. It's God's vision for our lives. It is God's vision for your life lived through you that gives your life impact. Mm. God's vision for my life lived through me is what gives my life impact. God's vision for my life lived through me is what gives my life impact. Let me tell you, success without significance is self-sabotage. People will erect their own visions. People will erect their own, own dreams. You can't squeeze enough life or meaning out of a secular accomplishment to satisfy your soul. You cannot. It will keep you searching. It will keep a hole in your soul so deep that your whole generation will fall through it. See, that's the world's concept. The hole in your soul that, that you are attempting to feel has an eternal and spiritual dimension that only an eternal and spiritual vision can satisfy. Mm. And this is why it's so important for you to discover and participate in God's vision for your life. And when I say God's vision for your life, again, I'm not talking about church. It, beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers. For the Lord taketh great prosperity, great pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. This is what you were made for. And what you're going to come to realize, hear me clearly, is that your homespun visions, as challenging and as demanding as they may be, they're going to fall short. They'll always leave you empty and wondering. And a whole lot of people, you look at how sad it is at so many celebrities and so many athletes. They pursued their homespun visions. Nothing wrong with that. But you can't do it without God. You can't do it without God. It will never work without God. See, we serve an intensely, an, an intensely creative God who God never makes two of anything alike. Wow. So God's vision for you does not stop thinking, oh, well, God, I would do it, but uh, every time I go on social media, every, that's why you need to stay off social media. Every time I go to do this, I see somebody else and they're doing it better than me. Oh, I can't do it like them. Oh, I can't sing like them. Oh, I can't do it like them. Or I can't become. Stop it. No one else in the earth is anointed to do what God has purpose and envisioned you to do and called you here for to do. We serve an intensely creative God. He has never made two of anything alike. That would make one of us unnecessary. God's vision for you, listen, Prophetess Amber, Frisk, Prophetess Christina, Yvonne, God's vision for you does not include pressing you into somebody else's mold. So stop it. Stop making excuses. Get out there and chase your vision. Get out there and birth it and bring it to pass. Stop using your excuses to cover your fears of doing what God told you to do. God is not in the business of conforming us uh, uh, to the image of other people and, and other Christians. Your uniqueness and, and your individuality 
will reach its pinnacle only in the context of your pursuit of it. If you never pursue it, that's why it never caught on fire. That's why it never morphed. That's why it never expanded. Because you let the devil immobilize you in watching how somebody else is doing what you thought God called you to do, like them. And unless you discover God's unique vision for your future, many of your lives are nothing but reruns. Your carbon copy of what you've seen. And there's no power in it. Because you're copying the fruit. But if the roots that produce that fruit are not also manifested in you, you have no, sus no sustenance to sustain it. And so you got to copy and you got to be a rerun all your life. Because you will not get to the place where you allow God to do and be in you and manifest his vision in your life. You got to do it. And so you've got to, in order to self-manifest, you got to come to self-discipline. I told you that's the first key. You got to self-discipline. Self-discipline is self-imposed standards for the sake of a higher goal. Our prophetess Amber, she wrote something and she posted it when she was out running one morning. And she promised God that she would keep the promises that she made to herself. Yeah. Self-discipline are the self-imposed standards for the sake of a higher goal that you must put on yourself. And this is the quality of all true sons and daughters of God. The quality of self-discipline. You don't have a vision if you lack self-discipline. And if you do, you won't have it for long. And self-discipline is something that's acquired during your silent years of discipleship. And so if you failed in discipleship, you're going to fail in vision. The person you are and the person that you desire to be are only separated by discipline. Mm-hmm. The person that you are, the person that you desire to be, is only separated by discipline. It's not a hard thing. Are you hearing me? It's not a hard thing. You have got to discover vision. And we're going to pick up here on next week. You must discover the vision of God for your life. People who've discovered vision live longer. Wow. That's no stress so because they don't let people move them. I believe that. They don't let people shift them. Uh, do you hear what I'm saying? They don't live by other people's philosophy. Uh, they're, they're not under the, the pressure and the stress of trying to impress people and try to live up to other people's uh, 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 expectations. People who've discovered vision live a long time because you're not going to move them. There is no stress. They know who they are. They know their boundaries. They know the direction that God has ordered their steps to go in and they're not going to try to walk in yours. See, stress comes from not knowing what to do. Stress comes from not knowing who you are. Stress comes from not knowing where I, I need to go. That's where your stress comes from. That's why you're stressed. And that's why you're perishing. And you need to know that your vision, it only comes from God. It's not a dream, it's vision. It comes from God. It is not yours and you cannot do it on your own without God and see that's the problem many of you you think you know what God wants you to do so you assume we don't be still we don't get in a place to be still long enough until we are clear and we have a revealation a revelation a revealation and this is what we read about Martha. When Mary and Martha encountered Jesus. That's it, sweetheart. Stress and perishing. Martha's like most of us. 
We live on assumptions. And we read about these sisters in, in the gospel of St. Matthew. Martha had a visitation from Jesus. Many of you know the story. He came to visit her and Mary. And Martha assumed that Jesus was hungry and ended up cooking a meal for him and got angry because everybody else was not helping in the desperation of her busyness. And this is where a lot of people are. You better get this tonight. So here's what she did. And this is where a lot of you are in the church. Uh, this is where a lot of you are in, in religion. So she came to Jesus and asked him, why won't other people come and help me? Send my sister in this kitchen and make her help me. And you know what Jesus said to Martha? Martha, you are so busy about many things. But only a few things are really necessary. Only a few things are really matter. I want you to ask yourself this question. Were the things that you've done these past 11 months yes. necessary? Yeah, I mean. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, all things are permitted for me, but do, but, but all things are, are, are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. But this is the way the Holy Spirit is giving it to me. All things are permitted for me to do, but all things don't benefit me. That's good right there. Awesome, awesome. All things don't benefit me. Listen, Francis. Listen, Rolanda. I don't care how old you are now. You're going to die. 70 or 80 years is so short. I look back on years and I wonder where did 19 go? Where did 20 go? Where did 35 go? Where did 45 go? Where did 50 go? It's so short. It's so short that you, you don't have time to be hitting and missing the mark and making mistakes anymore. Are you all hearing me? You don't have time. There was a time when God winked at our ignorance, but now he is commanding every man, all men everywhere to repent. You don't have time to be hitting and missing and playing church and fluctuating and arguing, fighting amongst yourselves. You don't have time to be playing. Same. My God. You don't have time to be making mistakes anymore. And many of us are already over 50. We're already beyond the 50% mark of our life. And even for many of you in here, it's time to define or refine your vision so that you waste no more days, so that you waste no more time. This is no time for experimentation. This is a time for intentional living on point and on purpose. Mm. So stop worrying and complaining about what somebody else is not doing, how somebody else is not on board, how somebody else spoke to me, how somebody else looked at me. Are you serious? You don't have a vision. You've got to know where you're going now. It's too late to be taking detours and going through unnecessary tunnels, unnecessary pitfalls that you have no business going through. Know your vision. It is your responsibility. It is your destination. There's some things and people in your life who have become unnecessary and you know it. They're eating up your time and energy. They rob you of strength and virtue and power. And God has been telling you, you're not getting to where I told you to get to fast enough because of your distractions. You're not getting to where I have envisioned for you to be because of your distractions. And all year, all you did, many of you was stumbled and tripped over the same thing. 
You waste time on people, things, books, games, everything. Uh-huh. Everything. I hope you're getting this tonight. Everything that you do from this point on, I want it to be, God wants it to be motivated by vision. Everything. Vision must be your source of motivation. Everything. Do you not know why people are actually poor? Poverty is not the problem. Poverty is the result. The slothful man shall surely come to poverty. He had no vision. She has no vision. Most people are poor. Many of you in this feed are poor because no one knows who you are. See, vision helps you to identify yourself before people. That's why I told you this ain't about church. God wants you to live. And because people know who you are and what you master in and what you bring to the table, they know what to come to you for. You self-manifest. You make yourself become a person of value. And I'm not talking about seeking success. Because I told you being successful, but not being significant within your own self-worth and value is sabotage. The devil will get you out there on that limb and you'll fall for anything. And this is why a lot of people have not made it and have not been successful. Because God gave them a vision and he opened that door and they got out there and brought God to an open shame. And he shut the door. So ask yourself this question. What have you mastered in? What do people think about when your name is mentioned? Because you've got to become so good in your God-given vision. I call it the carpenter's anointing. What Jesus was known for before he ever came on the scene. You become so good in an area where they can't ignore you. Because the sad thing about it in the world, and, and it's even sadder in the church, the world and the church is filled with general people with no distinction who live miscellaneous lives. They have no vision. The general population. Mm. And you have come to this place in your life. And you are hearing this word on tonight for you to cease being general. Know your value. Know your worth. Jesus knew his value. You know what Jesus said? He said, I am the bread of life. He knew his value to them. I am the water of life. And because he said it, even when the scribes and Pharisees tried to contradict it, the people still pressed him by the Thousands, despite the negativity from the scribes and the Pharisees. So no matter who don't believe in you, no matter who tries to fight your vision, all you've got to do is declare it. And when you declare it, they're going to throng you. You got to get this tonight. Many of you gave up too soon on your vision because you were throng and, and because the devil tried you and, and it seemed like it was falling apart and it seemed like it wasn't coming to pass and it seemed like what God told you was a lie. All true vision will be tested. If your vision is truly from God, life is going to test it. Life is going to test its authenticity. Is it something that was just conjured up in a dream? Was it something that was just conjured up in your flesh? Was it something that was just conjured up for the moment? All true vision is going to be tested. So get used to challenge. 
if your vision is real. The devil is going to fight you as hard as God confirms you. Jesus. If it doesn't come to stop it, if the devil tries, if it doesn't come to stop it, if it does stop it, it how am I going? If it comes to stop it, it can't. The devil can't stop what God has ordained. It didn't come to stop it. It came to test it. You thought it came to stop it because you felt the fire of the test and you felt the fire of the trial and you felt the refining of that vision and you felt the chastening of that vision. And you thought that the devil came to stop it. So you stop. And the truth is, Tracy, the truth is, Susan, if your vision was terminated by trials, it was probably not authentic from the beginning. Trials can't stop God's vision in your life. Do you hear what I'm saying? It can't do it. Can't do it. My daughters and I were thinking we're going and we're visiting Johannesburg, Africa on, on next year. We were going to go this year. And the thing I thought about with Nelson Mandela, Nelson Mandela's vision was so authentic that he was willing to go to jail and lose his life for it. He was a young lawyer and he went to South Africa and he, and he could have been just focused on the money. But his vision was so authentic in him that he was willing to die for it. Some of y'all can't even stand being lied on for your vision. And the thing about it ain't even about your vision, it's about you. How much are you willing to sacrifice for what you believe that you have been called to do? What kind of history do you dream of making? Is it just in the church? What kind of vision do you, what kind of history do you dream of making? What, what kind of history do, 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 do you, do you dream of doing? Uh, what, what is it that you want to do? Something that can't be erased from history. Oh, you just want to be surface. You, you just want to be temporal. That's, everything's got to be easy. Everything's got to be light and everything got to be. And if it's not, then you're going to fall out and, 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 and you're going to fuss and, and you profit, profit, chestnut blessings to you, son. What kind of history do you, do you think of making? It doesn't have to be great and massive. And this is what I want you to see tonight. Do you hear me, Amber? Do you hear me, Pastor Tiffany? Do you hear me, Damaris and Susan? It doesn't have to be massive. Like the woman who poured the oil on Jesus and dried his feet with her hair. We don't even know who she was. It just refers to her as the woman. Yet, listen, yet Jesus said what she has done will be spoken of throughout history. The memorial. will be spoken of throughout history. There were some little things that you were born to do. Hear me tonight. Yeah, everybody want to be great. Everybody want the great platform. Come on, honey. When you know for some people the hell that it took them to get there, and when you know how some have purposely perverted the platforms that you're trying to get to, you'll change your mind. There's some little things, some things that you think are insignificant that you were born to do to be the vital connector. Mm. Like Andrew. Yes. You don't hear in the Bible about St. Andrew, like St. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You don't hear anything about St. Andrew's gospel. Yet it was Andrew who brought Peter to Jesus. But his name was never even spoken of. <laughs> and if your name ain't called, if your name ain't spoken of, if somebody don't have your name in light, you don't think that your vision is even worth it or significant enough uh, for you to make a mark in eternity. You may never be on the platform wow. or under the camera lights. That may not be God's vision for you. But whatever it is, 
is not to be erased. And if you erase it, you're going to be cast into outer darkness. If you devalue the vision of God for your life, if you devalue what it is that he has called you to do, you were created to give life and make a mark in eternity with your gift somewhere. And when you desecrate it by your finite perspective of what you thought it should have been and what you think is not, you devalue God himself. You devalue God. I have something written here in my notes and I want you, if you can write it down, if not, go back and listen to it. Here are some things that vision will do when you discover it. Vision will choose your future. Vision will choose your friends. Vision will choose your library. Vision will choose your use of time. Vision will choose your use of energy. See, when I was in college, I had to take, before I could get to my major classes, I had to take electives. And they paved the way and prepared me for my major. Every elective and every class that I took had to be in coordination with my major for where I was going. Your friends, your library, your time, your use of energy, your recreation, your movies, your priorities in life, your hobbies. Everything must be in conjunction and in coordination with your major. Everything plays a vital, relevant role to your vision. It's feeding it or it's depleting it. Do you hear what I'm saying? And when we don't, when we don't seek God, then we don't have clarity. And we wonder, God, why? He told you who to remove and I'm going to make your vision clearer. Uh, you don't have bad eyesight. Mm, you got bad vision. See, I have, I have challenging eyesight. These glasses don't, don't change my sight. They help me see. So there are some things that you can put on and there are some things that you can put off. When I put them off, I can't see. When I put them on, I can see. There are some things that enhance your vision and there are some things that deplete your vision. When God tells you to put it off, your vision is going to get clearer. When God tells you to put it on, whatever way it is, your vision is going to get clearer. He's going to give clarity to your purpose. And purpose is what you were born to do. It's connected to your vision. And vision gives it clarity. Vision empowers you beyond your assets. Vision empowers you. So, so don't limit your movement. According to assets, according to what you see and according to what you have. Vision goes beyond your financial status. It, it doesn't allow you to live by what you have or what you don't have. That's not vision. It takes you beyond that. And you begin to believe in the things that you have no money or resources for. Because if you keep living by what you don't have, you'll never rise above what you don't have. Vision literally creates resources. Vision attracts resources. Vision attracts people. Yes, it does. But many, you want somebody to feel sorry for you and give to you out of pity and desperation. And what you need to know is people don't give to you. They give to vision. Where they see vision, they are going to sow. Where they see vision, they're going to give. And that's the thing this year for my businesses and last year, I got government grants and resources. And those government grants and resources were looking for vision. They weren't looking for me. They were looking for vision. And so what I have to do, I have to write a proposal and I have to write a vision and I have to make it plain up on tables. That's why you have to write it and make it plain. It's, it's called a proposal. You have to show your vision first. They didn't want to see my face. They didn't care who I was. Anointed, prophetess, apostle. They didn't care. They wanted to see my vision. Because it's not being given to me. It's being given to my 
vision. And this is why it's so important in the kingdom. This is why it's so important in, in, in the secular world. This, it, it doesn't matter where you are. This is why it's so important to clarify your vision and make it plain so people can see it. Yeah, this is why God tells you to run when ain't nobody supporting you and nobody is following you. Because he wants the vision to be so deep set in you that you will never again run because of a person, because of a feeling, because of a thing. It will be your vision all by itself that will keep the fire burning. Wise people make choices to protect their vision. And that's what I do. I had to make a hard choice. This week regarding my business, you got to make, you got to make choices to protect your vision. It, it, it doesn't matter. People's feelings are hurt. It doesn't matter. Cause see, when it comes to business, I tell people all the time, I'm a totally different female when it comes to vision, when it comes to business, I'm completely different. One way in the church, do not try to slither up on me in business and think you're going to get something for nothing because I'm a holy shark when it comes to business. And once you know where you want to go in life, vision will decide your choices. Vision will decide your company. People with vision have very few, fr uh, very few friends in life. Yes, yes. If you hanging out with anybody, if you running with anybody, if you have no definition and no demarcation to your company and your association, baby, you don't have a vision. You don't have a vision and you live a very loose life. Lots of acquaintances and sisters and brothers, but you're going to choose your friends who you call friend. You're going to choose them wisely. A friend is, is willing and committed to help you get into your destiny and anything that sabotages and anything that brings death, anything that brings threat to your destiny, they're not going to do it. They're going to stop it. They're going to guard you. And so your visions, listen, your visions and your dreams should be stimulated by your friends. Like Mary and Elizabeth's pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And so your discipline through vision attracts other people uh, uh, to you because you know the thing about it. People who lack vision are always attracted to people who have it. That's why discipline and vision attracts other people uh, to you. And you wonder why. Because people's greatest cry, most passionate craving and temptation comes from the voids that are within them. And they will always want to attach themselves to someone that has what they're craving. And that's why you have to be careful of the voids that are in your soul because your loudest cry many times comes from the void that's in your soul. Inner emptiness causes counterfeit cravings. Vision and discipline, oh what people yes. see, vision and discipline creates trust. Yes. yes, And that's why they want to be with you. And many times you have to test them and you have to try them. And if they want to be in your company, if they want to surround you, then they have to upgrade. You may have to help them upgrade because the discipline and the vision in your life creates a trust. That's why, see, this is why people, I'm going to say this and I'm going to be done and we're going to have a pickup next week. This is why people go to see athletes perform because they really admire their disciplines that they put themselves through to become the best. And if you do the same thing, people will begin to believe in you and what you say and, and trust you. And people uh, 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 will trust you when they perceive you to be disciplined in your vision. See, trust in disciplined individuals is built on, watch this. Trust in disciplined individuals and people with vision is built on the belief that their self-control, their reliability, and the commitment to themselves and their own personal responsibilities make them less likely to betray you and betray the trust of others. Those are the types of people that you should have surround you. And this is why they're, they're used to market. You look at the athletes and 
a lot of the famous people. This is why they're used to market and to advertise and to promote products. They are selling the discipline of that athlete. No, they're not selling their fame. That's what it looks like to impoverish minded people. They're not selling their fame. They're selling their disciplines. We think it's their fame. And this is why many people think if they wear Jordans, they'll jump like Mike, but it's not going to happen because you're not disciplined to jump like Mike. But this is the idea that sells Jordans. But, I mean, you're not buying Mike's success. You're buying the disciplines that produce the kind of professional athleticism that he's known for. And this is why many love to watch sports, but they're not going to play it. Because what it's going to take to play like Mike is going to cost you something. There's a discipline that's required. And so the same is true for you. What is it that you were born to master? And if you would remain consistent in the discipline of your vision, in your life, in your business, you would find that God would send the people and the people would come just to watch you, just to hear you, just to patronize you because your gift and your talent is how God has anointed you to contribute to society, to contribute in the earth. Do you hear what I'm saying? And when we are found faithful in and what God has given us to do, I'm going to close the book and I'll stop talking. Then God will trust us with something greater. Vision. What vision has the Lord given you? What is it that God has given you to accomplish that nobody else in the earth can do? And just as sure as God has given you a vision, it comes with weight. It comes with dissatisfaction by seeing what is and what should be by seeing what is and what could be. You don't just move on. You are the consecrated solution to bring change. My daughter told me the other day, she said, Mom, I'm going to have my own restaurant. That's your vision, do it. Mom, I am going to accomplish, ha have a vision beyond a man, okay? Have a vision beyond a woman. Okay, have a vision beyond sex, have a vision beyond this and that, have a vision <clears throat> so that everything in the earth realm, that's the only way it comes to you. When you get a vision, then God creates your service, then God creates those that will fund your vision. We don't come. We we don't come to the house of God. We don't come to church looking for that, uh, for for church to make us rich. And then we come in and nothing happens because we give our tithe and offering and prophecy was spoken over our life and nothing happens and we blame God. God failed me. No, you failed you. You failed your vision. Seek diligently for it. Write the vision, and make it plain upon tables. So that every time you read it, it puts running in your feet. It puts fire in your feet. Listen, I'm going to challenge you on tonight to sow a vision seed. And this is where the numbers will possibly drop. Mm -hmm. We want it. We don't want to traffic into the several realms of faith, discipline, for doors to be open. Sow your vision seed on tonight. That vision seed of $50. Would you stand in agreement with me for the kingdom, for the vision that you believe that God has deposited and sown in your heart and in your spirit? What is the prophecy that is to be broadcast? 
of the forefront of your life? What is the mark or the sign of God's revelation that is to be made manifest in your life, in your business? What is it? So that seed blessings to you, um, Elder Carter. I'm sowing, put it in the feed. If you're standing with me on tonight, put it in the feed because I'm standing in agreement with you. Blessings to you, Franz, uh, Francis Clark. Blessings to you, Donna Owens. This is not in an effort to get anything from you. This is in an effort to get something to you. Release that seed on tonight. Blessings to you, Prophetess Trinae. Release that seed on tonight. Blessings to you, Prophetess Christina. Pastor Azel, blessings to you, Pastor Tiffany. Prophet to Susan, blessings to you on tonight. Let's release the vision seed. Blessings to you, Elder Asher. I will have it on Friday. Come on, stand with me on tonight. Rolanda, blessings to you, my dear daughter, on tonight. Blessings to you. Listen, this is not in an effort. Blessings to you, Minister Bryce. This is not Sandra. Blessings to you. Amber, blessings to you, prophetess. This is not in an effort to get anything from you. Raymond Davis, blessings to you, son. Blessings to you, Mother Stewart. This is in an effort, Fris, blessing. To release the prophetic wind of manifestation to blow on your vision again. Damaris, bless you, son. Faith without works is dead. Nothing leaves heaven until something leaves the earth first. Blessings to you, Pastor Doris, sowing Friday. Pastor David, blessings to you, son. This is in an effort to get something to you. I'm telling you, bless you, Trina Pritchard. The blessings of God. I release a prophetic wind in your direction on tonight. Blessings to you, Caleb, Apostle. I release a prophetic wind on you tonight that the wind of God will blow on your vision, that it will stir within your spirit the vision that was initially released and spoken into your spirit. You may have forgotten about it. You may have rendered it. Irregardless... Alyssa, blessings to you, sweetheart. You have made, you may have rendered it disregarded. You may have rendered it forgotten. You may have set it down. You, you may have stopped believing in the vision because of the warfare that came against you as hard as God had confirmed it. But you need to know that God covers and protects the visions that he released out of heaven. Pastor Jones, bless you. Bless you, Jenea. God covers. And God protects what he releases. Believe again. Trust again. Initiate it again. Activate it again. Stir it again. Stir it again. Don't you give up on that vision. Don't you let it die. Your life depends on it. I'm telling you. Um, your life depends on it. Your life depends on it. That is the major angelic conflict. That is the satanic conflict. Every day you wake up. Isn't it something? Every day you wake up, he meets you at your bedside to tell you you're not. To tell you you can't. To tell you you won't. To tell you what God says about you. You know, to contradict what it is that God says about you. To be in conflict with everything God promised you. He meets you the moment you open your eyes. And just as hard as he hits you. You've got to know that's just as hard. That God. That's just as great. As God is. Confirming you. And has confirmed you. Believe again. 
Stand with me on tonight. I see so many of you that have already sown. Stand with me on tonight. If you don't have that $50 seed, release the best seed that you can into the kingdom. Do you hear what I'm saying? I told you earlier, this is why you need an apostolic and a prophetic voice in your life. They are so critically necessary to you in this hour. Because they take 90% of the pain out of your process. Where you stop, they push you. Where you believe you can't, they tell you you can. Huh? Where you stop sowing, where you stop <laughs> believing, they stir that gift of God within you all over again. You will not be the son or the daughter that does not self-manifest yourself in the earth realm. When you leave this earth, if the rapture does not happen first, you will have exhausted every drop of virtue that God has invested in you for the purpose of your vision. And there will be a memory of your posterity in the earth for generations to come. Vision will no longer be lacking in your life. You will no longer be, be broke down. You will no longer suffer from anxiety and impoverishment of mind. You remember this on tonight and I'm going to let you go. Whatever God created you to be, it's in you now. You don't have to ask him for it. You don't have to beg him. You possess it now. You were created with it in you. Your future is not ahead of you. Your future is trapped inside of you. And tonight, I call it forth. And tonight, I prophesy to you. And I release you from the ashes and the cinders that have had your vision buried beneath the lies, buried beneath the hurt and the rejection, buried beneath the depression. And I say arise and shine for your light has come. And the Lord is with you. Tonight I prophesy and I command your spirit to arise and walk. Arise beyond the limits of where you are. Arise beyond the limits of what you see. Arise beyond the limits and allow your spirit to walk abroad. Walk and discover what is beyond you. Walk and discover what is beyond the limitations of where you've been stuck. I command that complaining and murmuring will never again be your portion. That death has left you on tonight. Everything that has eluded your vision. The dismal darkness that you stood in is annihilated tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And God, we give you praise and we give you glory. And we honor you for who you are. And we thank you. Thank you for every seed sown. Thank you for every soul that is listening and that has been touched, rejuvenated, reactivated recalibrated cause the ascension to take place now in the wounds of their spirit cause that vision to mando cause that vision to breathe again cause the heartbeat of that vision to beat again in the name of Jesus God, I connect and couple my faith with theirs. That because God said it, it is so. God has never reneged on what he has mandated in and for your life. It is an eternity. And it lives and it breathes. And it is waiting on you to reconnect with it. From this night forward. Yes, 
We will not commit perjury in our spirits. Yes. We will not be a walking contradiction yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. of what it is that you have called us to do and be. Yes, oh God, but by your divine purpose, by divine. we come into agreement yes, Lord. with heaven. We come into agreement with the patterns and the plans that you have for us. We stand in agreement with your vision, your purpose, and your will. And we stand in direct contradiction with the works of darkness. And we say, have your way in us, Lord. Cause these visions to come alive again. God, let them know that you are here. Yes. Mm. And that you never let them go. Even when they let go, you never let them go. Even when they chose to live visionless because of storm and trial, you never left them. Stir us again. Stir us again. Cause them to eat for the vision, breathe for the vision. Let it awaken them in the night. Let it kick when they least expect it. And we thank you for the manifestation of every vision that will begin to move and operate beyond the boundaries of what they see, beyond the boundaries of where they are. And the weight of the burden will bring such a conviction that they will bring change to their homes, their communities, their jobs, their workplaces. And we give you praise and we give you glory. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you. Blessings to you.